All right, the board has now returned to open session here at 7.24 p.m. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody, we did originally gavel in at 6 p.m. and then went into executive session. I did want to take an opportunity to remind everybody that tonight there will be an opportunity for public comment. We have heard that there's a high demand uh, for public comment tonight. So I would like to encourage anybody that would like to leave a public comment to please go ahead and fill out a card and place it in the basket over there to my right. Typically, we uh, allocate about 30 minutes for public comment. I have extended that to 60 minutes tonight. But seeing the crowd here today, I ask that everyone please keep their comments to a three minute limit. Okay. All right, next up on the agenda is our non action item reports. First one up is communications. Listed on tonight's agenda are 68 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communication board members would like to share at this time? All right, then let's move on to reports to the board. We'll start with the superintendent report with Dr. Russell. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, before I start my report, I want to thank everyone for our delay. Uh, during closed session, we had to pause uh, for the, when the tornado sirens went off. So please know that we did not intentionally delay the meeting tonight, but appreciate everyone, everyone's patience and flexibility as we were a little bit delayed for the weather. So thank you uh, for sticking around. Uh, tonight, I'd like to deviate from the typical departmental style of my monthly superintendent's report. Instead, I'm going to address two issues that are consuming school districts and communities throughout the state of Illinois and the nation as a whole. To conclude my report, our team will preview the upcoming board meeting on August 18th, which will be designed to finalize our learning plan for the start of this school year. First, I'd like to address a cultural issue that is front and center in our national dialogue. Since last spring, school districts, including District 58, have received inquiries regarding critical race theory, also known as CRT. While District 58 has received only a handful of inquiries regarding CRT, I feel it's important to address this issue. To be clear, District 58 does not teach critical race theory. District 58 teaches children to treat each other like they themselves would like to be treated. The district stresses the importance of character education. We have met and will continue to meet with anyone who has questions about our curriculum. It's extremely important that we promote a strong dialogue between the district and community members. As we have continually shared during our public meetings, the district's strategic written plan calls for the district to address equity across all 13 schools. District 58 remains committed to ensuring that all students have access to high quality learning and programming. Please note that equity, or excuse me, equity does not mean that we are lowering the bar for any of our students or taking away opportunities from others. Ensuring that all students have access is the cornerstone of the educational system. As an example, this summer we offered additional assistance for students that were struggling much more than others due to the pandemic. Those students were invited to participate in additional learning over the summer. This was not open for everyone, just the students who needed the help. This is an example of our equity work. As always, all of our work will be done in a transparent manner that involves the community. Next, I would like to address mask wearing in schools. As many of you are aware, Governor Pritzker has mandated that masks be worn in schools due to the Delta variant of COVID-19. I recognize this is a decision that comes with many varying perspectives and emotions. Some have called for the board to ignore the mandate. Ignoring mandates places the district at risk of losing its accreditation and exposes the district to a high level of liability. This means we could lose state funding and get dropped from our insurance. ISBE previously placed the school district on probation for violating the mask mandate last summer. This is real and the governor has shared with us that he would go after districts. That means we could lose our funding. Despite all of this, we will work hard to bring light to some positives from this situation. For example, as a result of universal masking in the district, we will have significantly fewer students quarantined throughout the year due to differentiated requirements for quarantine. One of the district's highest priorities throughout the pandemic is to increase in-person learning to the greatest extent possible, and universal masking will certainly diminish the need for students to stay at home. On August 18th at 6 p.m., the district will present its final plan for in-person instruction for the 21-22 school year. 
This plan can now be finalized given that we received the final piece of guidance late Friday evening, which was then followed up early this morning. I do recognize that many people want the final plan out. We are still continuing to receive guidance as early as this morning and then an accompanying FAQ later this afternoon. Please know we are not stalling any guidance. It is coming this late from the state of Illinois. While we will present our plan next Wednesday, due to the ever-changing nature of the pandemic, the situation remains very fluid. The district is committed to following the guidelines and will continue to make adjustments as conditions change. This means if the guidance loosens restrictions, the district will follow suit and vice versa. I implore anyone, if you're not satisfied with the state's guidance or mandate, for instance, some may find it too strict and others may find it too restrictive. Please contact your representatives at the state level where these decisions are being made. Local school boards do not control the guidance or mandates from the state. As we move forward, I urge everyone to unite and come together for the sake of our students. Our children are watching and let's continue to be role models for them all. We've done a great job as a community during this pandemic and let's continue serving as an example for other school districts. At this time, I'd like to invite Justin Sissel and Jessica Stewart up to the podium to assist me with previewing next week's meeting where the learning plan will be shared. Justin is our assistant superintendent for curriculum and Jessica is our assistant superintendent for special services. I'll provide a high level overview of the plan. Jessica will speak to the health aspects of the plan and Justin will speak to the learning aspect of the plan. All planning is aligned with our three priorities, health and safety of our students and staff. We want to maximize in-person instruction and we want to minimize disruptions to the educational process. We are also going to adhere to the guidance from ISBE, IDPH, and the DuPage County Health Department. Those guidelines emphasize in-person instruction. So unlike last year where we had to have a remote option available, now all of it is designed for in-person instruction. The guidance allows for layered mitigations to be put in place. It allows for students to be in school to the greatest extent possible. Avoids almost all close contact situations with the exception of the bus and it avoids almost all quarantine requirements with the exception of the bus. Planning for a school year that is normal or pre-pandemic, except where current guidance requires us to make slight adjustments. So the good news is, with the exception of mask wearing, which is the first example, pretty much school is going to look like it did pre-pandemic. Let's talk about those masking requirements. While indoors, masks are required for all individuals, both vaccinated and unvaccinated. Mask exemptions for medical conditions do remain available. Schools must enforce the mask mandate. There is no mask requirement for outdoor athletic activities or any outdoor activities, meaning that no one has to wear a mask when they're outside. We will promote frequent mask breaks. We will also rotate staff and students through spaces in our schools that have air conditioning. Another example where the guidance won't allow things to be quite back to normal is lunch. At the elementary level, we will really try and meet the goal of six feet of distancing. Why do we want to make sure we have six feet of distancing? Because when students take their masks off, so long as they're six feet apart, they cannot be considered close contacts, meaning they don't have to go out for quarantine if someone is um, a, a presumed positive or if they are positive. We're working on creating an optional six foot distance area for middle schools. Middle schools is a little bit different because all of our students, because we're seventh and eighth grade, will be 12 years old. They all have had the option to be vaccinated. So social distancing is still important, but it's not as important as what you would see at the elementary level. So those are some examples of where it would look differently, but we are talking full-time, regular hours, five days a week, normal bus routes, normal clubs and activities, sports returning to our middle schools, passing periods. Things are returning to normal, and that is certainly something that we wanna celebrate. With that, I want to turn it over to Justin to expand a little bit more on our learning model. Thank you. And as Kevin mentioned, the, the entire purpose this evening is a higher level overview. Um, on the 18th, we will go into much greater detail on all of these topics. 
So as Kevin just mentioned, we are talking about students attending on-site five days per week at pre-pandemic lengths of school days. So the elementary and O'Keep day is 8.15 to 3 o'clock, middle school is 8.30 to 3.17. Our professional learning Mondays are reinstated for faculty, which have been such a valuable part of our curriculum development over the past several years. All of those times are posted in several places on district and school websites for families to be able to find at this point. We also are looking at three foot spacing in instructional areas, which will be possible in virtually every environment. We know always as we work to assemble classrooms and look at class sizes, there may be an occasional instructional environment that might be underneath the three feet guidance, but that is the new guidance for instructional spacing. And so we are really working to accomplish that across the district. As Kevin mentioned, students can move between instructional spaces now and materials can be shared. The, the spread of the virus on surfaces has been much less than what was originally believed to be true a year ago with the guidance we were under when we started last school year. And so that means that students can move from seat to seat in a classroom situation or in an accelerated math situation. It means that middle school students will rotate through their classes and not remain cohorted all day as they did last year. The emphasis is on hand washing and hand sanitizing as you enter or leave a new environment. It means that we can go back to using cubbies and lockers as long as we're setting up ways to ensure that there is distancing happening in those areas as well. It means that we can, can not only encourage but provide small group instruction and in all of those differentiation strategies that we have been using for many, many years. It even means that bathroom use will be a little bit more typical. Certainly we may still look at blocking off certain stalls so that we can maintain that three foot distancing even within a bathroom, but it doesn't need to be a single use scenario as it was in many of our schools. Kevin mentioned lunch and, and really it's any eating so if we are looking to have a snack in the elementary schools as we have pre-pandemic that would need to be accomplished at six foot distancing as well as and Kevin also mentioned lunch for our elementary students we would want to strive to achieve six foot distancing and utilizing outside areas when possible but we always have to plan for the day that it's pouring rain at lunchtime and make sure we can still meet the requirements at that point so we are working toward those in this week Recesses will look very much like pre-pandemic recesses. There is not an ability to be deemed a close contact outside. Students will be unmasked at recess. We're gonna still encourage that three foot arm's length distance. We may rotate certain grade levels on playground equipment, which is one of the areas that students congregate most in tight groups. But generally speaking, recess will be recess. Um, we also, as Kevin mentioned, are looking at the re resumption of activities and athletics and clubs at all of our schools. This will be a bit of a phased in process. We're going to begin with some of the district and building sponsored events and eventually move on to include PTA sponsored activities and outside vendors. Those are all really important. We just wanna make sure that in the first couple of weeks of school, our priority really is on making sure everybody is in the building at the right safe distance and receiving instruction. The last piece I'll preview regarding the learning plan is there also is the need for that home learning connection in the event that a student is, despite all of our mitigation efforts, finding themselves in a mandatory quarantine situation, which, which may well happen to students through nothing that may happen at school even potentially. So in that case, we have to recognize that we don't have a full remote learning scenario in place like we did last year. So there aren't remote sections for a student to join in that case. However, we're still committed to that daily connection between teacher and student and ensuring that the student is connected to their learning while they're under mandatory quarantine. There's a variety of ways to accomplish that. But we'll go into further detail about um, in 10 days or so with our next meeting. So now Jessica will take some time to talk about our health and safety procedures. And, and truly there is such a marriage between our instructional strategies and our health and safety protocols at this point I'm just going to call it a couple of uh, additional ones that we haven't talked about yet so the big thing is you know the CDC uh, gives us really these nine layered mitigation strategies that they ask us to put together that really have been shown to limit the spread of COVID in schools and so we're really looking at how we can maximize those within our school setting um, and with that letting fall away some of the practices that uh, we were all doing that we thought were effective that really uh, weren't impacting that and so one of the changes our families will see is uh, not needing to do that daily certification form at home every day um, and in addition, we will not be screening uh, students and staff as they're coming in the door. So um, what, what we'll be doing instead is encouraging families to be vigilant about checking uh, for COVID symptoms and, and other infectious diseases as they did previously um, and keeping students home when they're sick. And to that end, um, we will continue to do as we always have, which is when a student isn't feeling well, we're gonna walk them through that protocol and um, be sending them home with uh, guidance in terms of next steps with families. 
Um, arrivals and dismissal time at school will likely continue to be staggered. Um, with some of that uh, change to close contacts of being three feet, that allows us to um, use that arm's length uh, distance and, and not spread out that stagger as much as we had previously. But um, each building will have a separate kind of protocol for that, and we will be providing that to the public all in one document. So if you do have students in, in multiple buildings, you'll be able to check and see kind of how those mesh together. Um, as Kevin men mentioned, masks are mandated uh, on bus transportation. Um, and in addition, we will continue to have seating charts so that we can follow up with contact tracing if needed. Um, again, that contact tracing piece is one of the mitigation strategies we're focused on. Um, and it was very successful for us last year. Um, Justin uh, previewed a little bit about that essential visitor piece. You know, we will continue as we did last year uh, to allow only really people that need to get into schools um, to come in using current protocols, uh, but look to maybe open that up um, once we get the year under underway and kind of ensure that our systems are working well for, for health and safety. Continued daily cleaning procedures, there's not gonna be a change there. Um, I think one of the newer things for us in lots of districts is really our exploration of partnering with uh, a, a community partner for uh, considering voluntary and free weekly screening for students and staff who are unvaccinated. So um, this would be a program where families could opt in. Uh, there's no cost to families and there's no cost to the district and there's no charge to insurance. Uh, but, but we then could really be looking for that, um, that asymptomatic student who poten or staff who potentially um, could be spreading the virus. So this would be a nasal swab approach. Um, and we'll be talking about that more when we get back together. Uh, additionally, uh, partnering with uh, the, this particular vendor would also allow us, if somebody did become symptomatic or they were a close contact, to uh, implement what the state is calling a test to stay program so that students um, could on site take a test and uh, if it came back negative, they'd actually be able to to stay on site to participate in instruction. So there's some exciting opportunities there. I think we need to work with our community to, to see if that's something that we wanna move forward with. Uh, and then finally, uh, we will be voluntarily collecting vaccination, copies of vaccination cards so that uh, we can then work with families if a student is a close contact uh, to identify if, that, if their student needs to go or if they're able to stay. So that'll help with expediting some of that um, investigation and phone call work that we did last year. So more to come, there's lots in the works, um, and a lot of it is very exciting. So at this time, uh, Justin would also like to preview uh, the e-learning aspect of next board meeting, and then we'll take any questions from the board. Thank you. Just briefly by way of preview of next meeting, this is the meeting at which the board will conduct a public hearing at the beginning of the meeting, which is August 18th at 6 p.m., to hear any public comment on the uh, e-learning draft plan that's been presented. We will also um, launch tomorrow a, a brief survey, really a one question survey to families and to staff asking their feelings on whether or not the board should adopt this plan and present it to ISB for approval. And then the board will have an opportunity to take action at that, at that um, August 18th meeting. If the plan would to be approved, it would be submitted to ISB. We would not be able to enact that plan for another 30 days after final approval. And again, if approved, these days would be in lieu of, it, of a traditional emergency day and used judiciously by the administration. So this is really, again, separate from the, the specifics of this year's learning plan. It is, a, it is a, another entity. So any questions or anything that the board would like more information on as we come back and provide more detail next week as the plan gets finalized? One of the other things that um, we did mention, I, I know the board is aware and the community is aware, we do have working groups that are working right now um, with staff members as well, finalizing all of the details on both the instructional side as well as the health and safety side. I have a question. Um, uh -huh. As far as, so next week's meeting, is after that meeting is that when it will be released out to the mass emails to the community the parents yeah about all, all the finite details of so, gym and lunch and all that stuff yeah correct so it will all, be before that meeting. all of the details will be posted in board docs um is when we're giving the presentation and then we will follow up the day after the meeting with a detailed letter to families uh right now what's in draft form it's very similar to what our families would have had last year 
where we had a, a comprehensive book where it broke into sections where it would say, here are the health and safety protocols, here are the cleaning protocols, here are the instructional protocols. You will see a new iteration of that for this particular school year that will get sent out as well as summaries of the, the various components of the guidance. That will be sent out the day after next board meeting. Um, uh, also, as far as communication with teachers, mm -hmm. I know lots of teachers that work during the summer to prep for the upcoming year and put a lot of time in their classrooms and all that sort of thing. Is that when teachers will be notified about what, I mean, because if we're going from six feet to three feet or is it going to be rows, are we going back to desks, like all that kind of stuff, when does that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so the answer is yes and no. And what I mean by that is the overall plan will be shared with, with the staff and um, the community. The staff would get it right before the board meeting and the community would get it after the board had a chance to discuss. However, like today, for instance, we wrote a back to school letter for our teachers and we outlined some general parameters of the plan. We've attached the guidance. Our principals are back in. So as they're working with staff, they're, they're sharing with staff how the rooms can be set up, how they cannot be set up. The good news is with three feet of social distancing, that is pretty much how our rooms are set up in a normal year anyway. And so you're going to see rooms set up in, in similar manners, maybe not exactly, but, but pretty close to what we would have in a normal year. So Tracy, to answer your question, this is the, the yes part of it. As teachers are coming back, they're reading the information that we give them, they're reading the guidance, and then also the principals are working with them to answer any questions so they wouldn't have to do double or triple work. We really want to avoid those uh, scenarios. Because uh, you know, at a lot of the buildings, we had those pods that a lot of furniture was going into, so yeah. there's potential for, t for some of that stuff to come back out again now. Sure, so a lot of those pods are filled with um, you know, desks and things yeah. like that that we had to remove to achieve six feet of yeah. social distancing. Some of those will come back. Some of the things in the pod, won't be able to come back yet, um, but for the most part, classrooms are going to look very similar to what they did pre-pandemic, um, especially the shared items that we have, um, where manipulatives for math, for example, or some of the things that our primary students can use, they will have full access to those. And there will not be need to have 150 lunch volunteers again? Uh, there will not be a need to have as many lunch volunteers or extra workers as we had before. That being said, what our principals are working on, along with um, Jane and Justin, is going through each large space in the building, in, especially at the elementary level, figuring out how many kids we can fit in a six-foot setting. Again, to avoid those con close contacts, our, our priority is to keep kids in school. And so we're looking at places like, and none of this is, is finalized, but gyms and lunch or uh, libraries and other big common areas where you could seat kiddos where they wouldn't become close contact. So you may also have a need for some students to eat in the classroom, which we have in a typical year. So that's where you could require some additional lunchroom supervisors, but certainly not on the scale where every single not student was eating in their classroom. But Sorry. I don't wanna say we wouldn't use our ESSER funds for some extra staff because we likely will need some. Okay, sorry, to, I know it's all no, gonna be next okay. week, but those are the types of questions well, I'm getting are, in, from the community and. Yeah. No, and I, I appreciate that because this allows us to highlight certain things and put more emphasis on it when we come back next week. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, uh, one of the things that you alluded to was um, the ability to do that testing. And I guess the question I have for you, in, and I know we're going to go into more detail, I, I, I just like, I guess I want to prime the pump a little bit here, and that I could see some of our families concerned about engaging in a relationship where they're do, their children are tested on a weekly basis. With that said, they may, though, be comfortable having the opportunity to be tested to stay so that they don't have to go through that privately. Is that something that has to be everything or nothing, or do they have an opportunity to go, no, I, I want to opt out of that, but uh, I, I want to have the right to be able to test to stay um, just because they, they had a, a small symptom? Yep, we will um, have the capacity to do both. So um, the mass screening really is about, again, trying to identify students who maybe don't know that they have COVID yet to try and slow that spread. Um, but certainly if a student is symptomatic, um, actually our health offices will have the capacity to actually administer um, the, the test on site and then results come back in less than 24 hours. That's given via email to the family and then provided to the district as well. Okay, but it doesn't require being part of the weekly plan. Be, okay, yeah, you got it. <clears throat> I also want to be clear that testing and the guidance is one of the mitigation strategies that is called for. 
in no way, shape, or form are we saying that this is a mandatory thing yeah. that we would force a family in or a child in or whatever. This is not something that we would do. This is voluntary. We have several community members that are asking for this assistance, especially those community members that can't afford it or have trouble accessing that. Uh, so this would be a service as a mitigation layer that we would offer, but we would not make it mandatory. The tool in the toolkit. That's exactly <laughs> correct. Yeah. Seems to be the word we That's use a lot right. lately. So. And this is one of those mitigation strategies that haven't been out there very long, so there's a lot of education that would need to come with this one in particular, too, so people understood what they were opting into. I also want to assure our public and our staff listening in that um, privacy and, and health information is, is taken extremely seriously by the school district, and um, the group that we're looking to partner with as a hospital organization will share more of that information coming up, but they would be the ones who are responsible for keeping that information, not the, the school district. I want to be very, very clear on that. Thank, Thank you. you. And then Justin, for you real quick, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to beat a dead horse here. I think it's, it's quite apparent um, going into this that I'm a strong opponent against our I instituting an, an e-learning plan uh, for next year. Uh, and, and we'll discuss that you know, further in the next, uh, about 10 days from now. The question I did want to ask is I think that there was some level of, of all seven of us, even though we were split board on the idea of e-learning, that maybe an hour and a half of FaceTime with their teachers was not enough. Are we looking at the same proposal that you came to us with last month, or has there been any any updates that we should be prepared? Like, is there going to be changes, or is it going to, you don't have to go into all the detail, I know we're going next month, I just the, the, want to be prepared. The singular change to the draft plan is exactly what you have suggested, and we've revised it to align more with the remote learning plan that we did have last fall, where the, it essentially is half an, it, it's at least half of the entire learning day would be synchronous or live connection time. Okay. Good deal. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I just, um, before we move on, I, this summer has been another summer filled with, you know, constant changes and, and constant evolving guidance. And, and I do want to uh, give a shout out and I want to thank our district office administrators uh, for the long hours, the weekends, the foregoing vacations uh, to make sure that we're staying on top of this. Um, I understand and recognize that it's frustrating for the community not to have everything finalized. Um, we are just as, as, as frustrated with that. Um, but nevertheless, we're going to stay positive. We're going to make a plan that emphasizes our three priorities. And um, we're, we're excited to bring that to the board and the community next week. Having said that, I wish everything was back to normal. I wish I didn't have to be the superintendent of a pandemic. Because no matter what decision we make, it's going to not be enough for some and it's going to be way too much for others. And so we will continue to focus on our priorities and continue to maximize that in-person instruction because that is what is the most important thing. We need to have our kids in school for all 176 days to the fullest amount of time, and we're going to do everything we can to promote that. Well, on behalf of the board, I just want to say, I want to say thank you. Um, I think that all of us uh, really would have liked to have that information out much earlier, too. But I think all of us sitting up here, and I don't want to speak for everybody, but I'm going to try to, is say that had we done that, we would have been wrong because everything keeps changing on us. So, uh, you know, we, we got caught last year, had a full plan in place, and then had to start the year uh, remote because our, our plan no longer met the state's guidance. So, uh, I appreciate the tremendous amount of, of change and stuff that's going around, uh, around and, and how much we have to pivot uh, quite often. So, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I also just want to quickly say thanks. Um, I, it, the amount of community emails we are still receiving on this shows community involvement. So no matter where you lie on the spectrum of the issue, having a community that is involved and cares for the students overall is a great showing. And it's one of the reasons why I love this community and I love being in this district. So I'm not able to attend next week's meeting. I had a prior planned vacation before the special meeting got called, but um, thank you to everybody for your involvement. I'm reading all of the emails. I'm reading all of the commentary. Um, no matter where you lie on it, people are very involved and very caring about this issue. So I, that does not go unnoticed. So thanks. All right. Uh, next up is our monthly business report and our treasurer's report with uh, Todd Drapel. I'm going to 
to start with, uh, since I'll be up here for a little bit, I'm going to start with Kevin Bardo and uh, construction report and let him give that uh, in brief. Well, how brief? We have several construction projects here. So uh, quick construction updates for everybody, uh, for general public also. It's down to crunch time for contractors to wrap up the summer work. Uh, we do have a couple projects that are still off schedule with the return to school year. Um, you know, we're kind of running out of days to make that up compared to earlier in the summer. Um, for the Henry Puffer basement and three O'Neill classrooms, the flooring contractor has finished the flooring uh, installation in the wall base. They still have a few touch-up items to complete, but otherwise those rooms are ready for furniture. The Henry Puffer uh, primary playground pavement and the Herrick pavement, contractor finished installing the concrete curbing and the asphalt. Um, we just need uh, final striping over there at Herrick. The Kingsley server, Kingsley server move um, was ready and we completed the move with minimal downtime. We are still waiting for the generator to be delivered uh, and installed later this week. The Highland Playground, the contractor is mostly finished with the job and thanks to all the volunteers that contributed for the community build. Um, we just have brick paper installation remaining and final landscape and then we have some uh, asphalt restoration after that. The Fairmount mechanical equipment, some equipment will not arrive until one week before school. So thus we anticipate this project to go into evenings or Saturdays during the school year. We are working with Principal Niferatus on any preparations that may be necessary for the start of school. The Pierce Downer Roof uh, and uh, Masonry. Masonry contractor continues to work on the exterior joints around the building. They're almost finished with that. And we anticipate the final roofing by uh, August 14th, weather permitting. We do anticipate some other topics running over, including sheet metal and site restoration. And we're working with Principal Wagner on the changes and preparations that may be necessary there. Uh, the Pierce Downer mechanical equipment, major components are in place, and the final controls and wiring are still occurring. So unfortunately, not 100% where we'd like to be, but several projects are in good shape. The projects that are behind um, are not unique to our district. There's several districts that are having trouble. A lot of it is COVID with supply chain. Um, for those projects that aren't finished, they are to a point where it's safe to bring kids to, uh, back to school. And obviously we will make sure we will have any plans in place to bring kids safely to the buildings through any remaining site disruptions at those schools that are still lingering. So with that, any questions on construction? When you, when you talk about uh, accommodations that need to be made because the construction is not complete at some of the buildings, can you give us a flavor of what might need to change in the normal school day? Sure. So especially with last year, we used a lot of different entrances coming into the doors. So for example, at Pierce Downer, um, on the back side of the building towards the playground, they used several of those doors. So this year, um, if things you know don't get caught up, we wouldn't be able to use a couple of those doors like where they came in the library or, or those doors last year. Got it. Is that also true at Fairmont or a different accommodation? Fairmont's a little bit different, uh, not substantial as construction um, as Pierce Downer. So it's more um, just that the work isn't finished, but it shouldn't, shouldn't be as impactful to the school as over at Pierce Downer. Thank you. So how do we actually certify that it's safe, right? Like who, who's actually making the, the sign off between sure. like buildings and grounds versus building leadership? or anyone else this is a good question steve um so the roe actually has final say on uh occupancy so most maintenance projects are classified as uh completion projects um for instance the lester addition would be an occupancy where you cannot occupy that space um but as far as uh these maintenance projects whether it's a roof or mechanical equipment as as long as it's safe um it, it is our district's determination whether it's principal or myself to say this is safe for kids if it is more substantial then the roe actually comes out does a walkthrough and they have the jurisdiction on that and then so steve as part of that process too once the roe deems it ready to go um, we get a form at the district office that both the superintendent and the board president have to sign off on it as well good thank you i have some in my packet <laughs> yes okay thank you Well, it's August, so it's that time of year for budget. Um, we have the year-to-date report. Uh, before I get to the budget, hit that piece first. Um, 
through the end of July, it's it's one month, so it doesn't give you a whole lot of information other than the first 30 days. You will notice, though, in the revenue side, um, that the property taxes and actually uh, corporate personal property is higher in July than it was in the prior year. Um, the county, and, and we, we talked about this last month with our year end for June 30th on cash, uh, had changed its collection system, and so we missed, I should say, a collection cycle that usually comes in at the end of June came in July. So you have that shift. We had that adjustment and talked about our fund balance and our revenue piece for, for year end. Uh, but obviously you're going to see that in the cash reports and so you'll show that, you know, that revenue piece is added in there this year uh, versus last. Overall, it'll carry, it'll, it'll clean itself out over time. Uh, August meeting is when the board has to uh, put on display for the 30 days prior to the budget hearing uh, in September uh, the fiscal year budget. <clears throat> this year, um, the budget on an operational basis is $560,000 to the good. Reminding everyone from last year, um, as we were in the middle of everything, we were $1.6 million negative. Now we ended up in a positive position due to, and the board uh, remembers this is the transportation um, reduction in expenditure, as well as the increase in um, federal funds to help uh, cover some of those expenses, many of those expenses that COVID caused, as well as some, you know, uh, rentals and, and so forth that we had uh, throughout the year. Additionally, in this year, we have a large amount of federal uh, ESSER money uh, into the budget um, for meeting some of those needs. As you heard in earlier presentation or discussion uh, and what you're going to uh, see in a, next week about what we're doing coming back, uh, there is some potential pieces that we could have some increase in costs, uh, hopefully in not looking at what we had with lunch supervision at the end of last fiscal year or last school year, but certainly have those potentials. And so our budget's kind of, it's been in flux. It will have some changes between the budget that is on display and the final budget. That is not uncommon. We have adjustments that we have made uh, in previous years as well. Um, for example, we had a revenue number come in from the state after the budget was put together uh, last week where we have an increase in our corporate personal property. That will obviously be reflected in the final budget. But that hearing will be uh, in at the September meeting and then approval. That's the final step in the process um, that started back in December with a presentation about financial plan, the development and review of the financial plan since December 7th of 2000 through the approval that the board did, I believe in April, um, carried to today and then onto the budget uh, approval the next month. And then we start the next budget cycle the following month when we start talking about the tax levy and that's part of the revenue stream for the fiscal year 23 budget <clears throat> in the board uh, document we we have three uh, items that are connected uh, for request for approval for this evening we thought it best to try to encapsulate all three, because they're all related, into one memo. So you have three action items with three recommendations, but you have additionally one uh, documented piece to help bring together um, the overall review and cost and, and analysis of, of those items. Um, the district for many years has had a conversation about what to do with a Longfellow the former Longfellow School, the Longfellow Center uh, on Prairie. Uh, the board back in May put up uh, for sale with a resolution for $3.8 million uh, for their property. When we opened bids, we did not, we received one bid. It did not meet that $3.8 million threshold. Um, in reviewing that piece, we talked to multiple vendor or uh, companies who had reviewed the bid and come up with a, a, a point that the price was too high for them 
and the financing structure um, required them to borrow money far out before they would have access to the property. So we've made some adjustments and recommendations to the resolution coming up for this evening. Through all of that process and through the last, I forget how many months, six, eight, nine months, we have had a conversation about potential lease properties. Uh, Kevin Bardo's done it and give, uh, giving him credit for a huge amount of work in reviewing a lot of property throughout Downers Grove um, and in negotiating and talking to multiple uh, property managers and, and landlords. Uh, the district, through that process, worked and developed um, what we found to be the best suitable uh, solution for the district at 2300 Warrenville Road. It is a Class B property. Uh, it is a sublease of the uh, of Aramark uh, from the, the landlord. Um, it is for f essentially 5,300 square feet of office space. Please note that the uh, Longfellow property is 14,000 plus. In our view process, what we determined, one of the big pieces that we needed was we need some professional development space as we need it and we need a set amount of office space. And so in this process, an understanding that we needed a much smaller office footprint um, allowed us for some additional savings. Also, this property has a rent by use facility for professional development, conference rooming, and so forth. And so that allows the district to have and rent and pay for on a monthly basis or own and control and, and, and run and manage a much smaller footprint. Um, what we have developed into this piece and you see on the, on the table is the annual rent cost and a budgeted amount of what we think will be the high end of our rental use. Um, when we started, we had over 200 events that we look at that may need uh, between committee meetings, board meetings, uh, councils, uh, institutional. A lot of that time is during the day uh, when teachers are, you know, meeting in a group. And so having, off, having space available in schools is just not uh, something we can do. So in all of that review, we have come up with uh, a lease that we thought was and we think is a extraordinarily good deal for the district. Uh, we have worked through and, and <coughs> I should back up like two steps. We talk about that, that, that Longfellow has been looked at to be sold. It is something that we've looked at with the strategic plan, the master's facilities uh, group, uh, the Financial Advisory Committee has reviewed this for several years. The Citizens Task Force has reviewed uh, this process and this concept, as well as the, the, the Superintendent's Advisory Council. We've been working through this piece to come up to this, this point. Um, the cost that we have developed is about $147,000 a year for the lease um, based on on those parameters of per event use and the office space. Uh, because it's in a, a good environment, uh, we were able to secure what we think is and what we've been told. And I've actually had a conversation with a few people off of a, a far from Downers Grove and I told them what our square footage price was for office space and they looked at me and were a little astounded in, uh, at, at how low our cost and our rate was because they certainly were paying a lot more. Um, but we've also come up with that it'll be a 2% per year increase, far below the current CPI, which is been hovering around 4.3. <coughs> we also, um, this piece, and there's been conversations about what type of lease we would have. Certainly other properties had net lease pieces. We rolled those up to figure out what the gross rate would be. Uh, this is a gross lease, so this includes everything. Uh, for $16, it includes all of the cost of utilities, the cleaning, um, maintenance, taxes, whatever those extra things would be um, into that, that piece that's included in there. It's not a net lease. So we know what we'll be paying on a monthly basis. 
<coughs> we reviewed that against what um, we currently have a cost for Longfellow. And we've reviewed this and, and the numbers we had put on earlier was that we, we didn't include the snow removal in the, in the lawn care. So we added those in. And so what we come out to be is that the maintenance and the maintenance of Longfellow and the cost for us to continually maintain Longfellow and run it and to do those capital pieces. And again, we take the average, we looked at annual cost per year that we're spending plus what the next 10 years of capital items would be that we would need to do um, to stay in that building. Now, we understand that the average, you know, and we spread those across on a per year basis to give an example and a structure of what this looks like and to give a comparison piece on what our lease cost will be. Those capital pieces as we all know and as, as we've as the board has seen through bills and conversations don't just necessarily happen in that format um, we've continually talked about the fire alarm system we know that if it goes down it's not a repairable thing it's a $75,000 replacement uh, we asterisk most of our cost with but this doesn't include including those does not include the, if we have to replace boilers and to, to maintain that facility, which is a $200,000 spend. Uh, it looks at what that roof will be and at some point. So those aren't spread over each year. These are budget numbers that we would put in and look at for comparison pieces. We know that, and we've found out with Herrick and some other properties as we are looking at our continual capital needs, that sometimes things are going to have to be replaced and we don't get a choice as to when those things happen particularly with 70 some odd year old buildings. Uh, those prices and those impacts could come in in 22, 23, 24, or 28. Um, but we need to account for those and, and give a comparison piece when we look at what our costs are for leasing versus what our costs for ownership is. This table includes the savings piece as we've talked about with the board that we have planned on and started effectively July 1st. We're covering a half position at this point, uh, waiting for the consolidation of staff, understanding that we have some, some push uh, right now of coverage uh, in that piece, but know that you know our goal is down the road that we would uh, be able to equalize out staffing once we're combined into one team. Um, just kind of remain reminding or, or letting the audience know that we do have an administration team split between two buildings uh, and there is some overage and, and some uh, some pieces we can do consolidations when we're in one, one, one facility. Overall, when we look at over a seven year period, uh, the cost impact of the lease versus ownership, uh, on, a, on that basis, it's a, a $46,000 uh, spend. Um, Without the staff savings, with the staff savings, it's about $234,000. Did I just go back to the right? Looking at what we are recommending to the board this evening uh, and going back to the resolution um, on the property initially. initially uh, the property resolution was at $3.8 million. Uh, as we noted last month in the July meeting, you know, when we initially went out with this, we didn't want to undervalue uh, a, a district asset. Um, and so did we aim high? Apparently, yes, we did, um, because the market has told us that. Uh, having a bid that did come in and someone did respond with uh, a bid that was below that piece, uh, kind of gives us an idea of what the market piece is. Listening to potential bidders and listening to what their response was to our resolution structure, um, price and financing were the two pieces I noted before. Uh, other things that were not yet, and, and, and one thing that they had said they would like is a more specific number on demolition and abatement. There was some estimates put into that bid uh, that was submitted. 
um, we have gone through with our uh, asbestos company and they've given us a number. Fortunately, because um, the district has done renovation and work in that building, a lot of asbestos has been removed from that place. Uh, and it's a very, it's a smaller number than one might think of a 70 some odd year building. Um, the quote for demolition came in around $197,000, $200,000. So that gives us, and certainly what we will do, the board does approve resolution is all of those items and all of those uh, documents will be made available out on the website with the resolution and any other information we have on the property to give bidders as much information as they need uh, to form a, a, a proper bid. Uh, we additionally have reached out. We understood that perhaps some um, firms that do build in the area may not have noticed the newspaper article or may not have been paying attention to the district um, in, the, in the sale of the property. So did some quick Google searching and uh, made a few phone calls to some firms that do build in, in Downers Grove uh, that were not aware of the property. And so we know we've given one tour uh, in the last week or two uh, to a new firm that is uh, looking at the property um, and certainly have you know reached out to others to let them know that this may in fact be coming up again um, who were looking at it previously. So we do believe that those efforts will also bring in uh, and attract some additional bidders into this into this piece uh, and tour the bill. So we noted the current cost of ownership is $140,000 a year. Uh, again, we asterisked it with a, you know, the boiler replacement piece. Current estimate for the rooms with the, with the rates is about 148. Uh, add in those savings pieces for the staff and the average savings over seven, uh, six full years is about $27,000. That doesn't have any increases in inflation for the cost of, of Longfellow. We know that that would, would incur. Um, that's why we believe that this structure allows for both an economically and a financial sense that we have savings uh, in the sale of Longfellow. Um, there's a question asked if we had to uh, mothball, if we did not get a bid this time and had to just uh, shut it down and, and still go through with the lease piece, how much would um, the building be? About three, uh, three thousand, four thousand dollars for a firm to come in and help us shut down all the utilities, except for the very bare basics, uh, some pump operations and so forth, um, and s about eight thousand dollars a year for on an annual year um, for ownership of the property. Ninety percent of that is simply grass cutting. Yeah, we wouldn't do snow removal at that point. Um, and the, the utilities would be very, very bare uh, minimum as to what we would need to do. Um, so the biggest cost would be the grass. The continual use of Longfellow, um, as the board ha is aware, of, we've put through, and our estimates are to use two and a half million dollars of the proceeds uh, of Longfellow into the summer of 2022 capital work uh, for to help tackle some of the hundred some odd million dollars in, of deferred maintenance in school buildings. If we were to continually use Longfellow in its current form and require, uh, we would need to come up with about $3.3 .3 million because you have to do some work on Longfellow plus the two and a half million dollars that we were earmarked to go towards uh, those capital works to, to make some of those continual changes and adjustments because we need to keep moving towards and updating our facilities. Um, if we were to renovate and use Longfellow as an administrative facility, it would be about an additional five and a half million dollars because the cost of it is extensive uh, to update and retrofit. Additionally, as, as we've noted, we are looking at trying to be efficient with our system and our structures and our square footage that we maintain that isn't geared towards students. We're going into a 5,400 square foot office space and using facilities as we need, as opposed to maintaining and running um, facilities because of their, they're there in that format. I think that is it. 
questions? Um, thanks, Todd. Uh, a couple questions. Um, just a clarification on your last point there, um, $3.35 million versus the $5.5 million. That is, when you say uh, to renovate Longfellow, the additional $5.5 million, when you, when you use, use the word renovate, the, the, what I'm supposed to conjure up is an image of um, renovating Longfellow and combining ASC staff there um, long term. Is that what you mean by renovate? That's why, that's why it would mean additional $2 million? There's a table, and, and in the memo, right, exactly, and, and in the memo itself and the, is that table that we have used for many months that talks about that we've used, I shouldn't say many months, for a year or better. I think we, we started it somewhere in 2019 when we've started this conversation um, of how much would it be if we bought a property, renovated it, you know, uh, like a commercial strip mall type right, property. Right. If we did this, we did it. We did and one of those that we added in was, uh, you know, was the cost from 2010, 2012 report of turning Longfellow into the administrative center. Mm -hmm. And that would be truly a complete renovation of that, you know, all the abatement, replacing all the boilers, replacing all the systems, uh, bringing it down, you know, and, um, and by the way, that cost for doing that was exceeded the cost of replacing on site. Mm -hmm. And that was tearing it, you know, building a new building behind it and then tearing that down and using that space then for the, you know, essentially for a parking lot. Okay. That's um, why I assumed I just agreed yeah. to the clarification. Um, the other um, piece um, to ask a question about, um, you talked about mothballing the building. Um, so f I guess as I understand it, for a, um, for nominal costs, really, in the grand scheme of things, we could just shut out the building and, and just leave it there. Um, I know you're not recommending that, <laughs> um, but I just, can we just have a little bit more um, clear, I mean, like, I, in my head, I, I am imagining many reasons why that's a bad idea. I'm thinking about, you know, the elements and the fact that that roof is not gonna last forever anyway. Um, can you? It would, uh, I, it, you're right. It you would not, be, it would not be our recommendation to do so if, if in the event the you know we did not receive a, a another bid you know a bid that we were that the board was happy with at this point, um, the cost to continue the process of moving out and leasing mm -hmm. and shuttering that building um, and doing the, the the renovations at the ASC and converting that space into the warehouse maintenance. Uh, tech area, you know, uh, repair area. Um, that the cost of maintaining and owning the property would be very, very minimal. Um, and I mean, really you're talking over a long period of time. That building's not going to need any work from just. And and, and it, you're right. It would not. I mean, obviously, it's still. You're right. At some point, that roof is not. Regardless of who's in it or what's in it, that roof is not going to last. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know it's. We know we're not going to replace the boilers. The it's fire a temporary. System, it, it, it was not a permanent replacement or a long-term roof when it was replaced. So many years, ten years ago, uh, it has a shelf life, and at some point, it would need. You know, you would. Yeah. We would start to have issues and have to address sure. in some capacity. And yes. Windows, tuck pointing. There's all of that. Yeah, we have those aren't upfront costs, but over over an extended time period, when you just have a building sitting there idle. Those things can't be ignored. It would right. It, we 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 would likely want to move towards a different solution, um, whether it be, you know, no, now knowing and having a demo cost that is not six hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and you know, a demo estimate that is, uh, you know, at some level reasonable. It's possible the district could look at doing that and then determining how, uh, because there are several builders when I talked to them said. You know, it's far. It's worth far more to you if you just sell them lot by lot. And I said, well, we don't want, wish to be in that business. <laughs> We're in the education business, and this is, you know. But you know, the, the, we know the property still has a value, mm -hmm. um, and you know, uh, that would be an alternative solution or option um, for the board to consider. Sure. I appreciate. That. I just want to make sure that we're, we're yeah. clearly fleshing out why. Mothballing Longfellow isn't 
really a good idea. It was a question asked, and so we wanted to make sure, sure we had the answer for you, but it sure. would not be a recommendation for us. I don't think it would be right. I think that, uh, I'll tell you, I asked that question because I wanted to see what the additional cost to us would be if we were carrying a lease and Longfellow was an idle building. Sure, got it. Makes sense. Just to understand what that potential cost would be to us to keep the building sitting should we not receive a responsive bid. Got it. Um, because, you know, now we know the demolition cost, you know, mothballing a building doesn't get rid of the fact that you have a fire system and you have a boiler system issue. So that would be a discussion at that point in time, should we get to it, of which one is a better option um, as we continue to look at, if we should need to continue to look at um, other options available to us. Any other questions or comments? Are you at yeah, and I, there, there's one piece I omitted, and, and obviously we didn't have it on the, you know, the, we, it's in the memo, but not on the PowerPoint, is allowing us to move forward. You know, moving forward with all three puts the district in a position um, that as conversations develop and continually move through with opportunity at the village to be part of uh, a village hall a format, um, those pieces, you know, as they come together, uh, have an opportunity for the district to decide if that's advantageous and, and, and makes sense to go forward with that process. Um, we have structured the lease in a way to ensure that the district has an op, which we're very um, happy with the folks at, at Aramark in that they have been a very good partner in working with understanding where we're at where the village is at and um, you know putting a bid process or I'm sorry a lease together uh, that meets our needs that allows an option out um, within a window you know if that comes to fruition and makes the most sense and financial sense for the district and you know and the people of Downers Grove no and we appreciate that that really is teeing us up for our long-term plan over the next uh, 50 years that, that that has been so important uh, to this board in in totality um, so we really we really appreciate the flexibility that 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 gives us in in being able to to move forward so we appreciate it other questions comments uh, for Todd any questions or comments on the budget or on the year-to-date mm -hmm. thank you All right. All right, the policy committee did not meet in July, nor did the legislative committee, though the financial uh, committee did. Um, just to kind of give you uh, our agenda in the FAC meeting looked very similar to, to the action items that we, that, we had, that we have on the books today. Uh, the, the first thing we talked about was the, the tentative budget. Uh, just a couple of things I want to note on there. The, uh, Todd just talked about it. This this is obviously the tentative framework that we're going to put together, and he's going to continue to kind of fine tune that and get that ready for our public hearing that we'll have in September. Uh, one wrench that kind of got thrown into that a little bit is, if I if I take you back a little bit, when I when I first got on the board, there was a uh, and uh, Greg, you were there with me. Uh, there, there was a deficit budget, and we started working on making sure we could balance it. And then the next phase of that, we really got into. How do we tee ourselves up? So, because we were getting nervous about tax anticipation warrants, how do we prevent that kind of stuff in the future? And we got into the idea of creating a fund balance policy. Uh, the interesting thing about this year, uh, while it's very welcomed in the fact that uh, we, we're getting ESSER funds, I mean, that's very beneficial to us in the district. When we live in a state that, uh, for DuPage County, they say they're holding us harmless, but what that really means is they're holding us flat when our expenses have been anything but. Um, is that we do got an additional what is it, around 1.2 million dollars but that money has to be spent in a, in a certain particular way and that that is just kind of messing with the numbers in the way that we do the fund balance the whole purpose of that policy is to make sure that we we handle our low point correctly so I, I'll, we'll continue to work with with Todd to get some final numbers and make sure that we can have a discussion around that making sure that uh, even with those ESSER funds being in there, even if those things don't line up exactly at 35%, that we make sure that we're meeting the spirit of the policy that we created and make sure that we have an opportunity to talk about that because the policy itself is not uh, a pie in the sky goal that we're trying to, re uh, to reach, but it's something that is incredibly important to this board. And uh, we have some interesting finances in, in the way that they're, 
running this month because of the additional federal funds. Uh, moving on from that, we talked about um, the resolution for the sale of the ASC ren uh, renovation bid and the sublease. And we talked about how, how these all worked in conjunction and, and sort of the time frame that we just went through. The FAC has continued to be an incredible sounding board uh, of our community and community members that are incredibly uh, well-versed in finance, uh, a lot of them are. So uh, it, it was a great opportunity for us to really have a, a discussion there. They've been a, a, a good partner uh, in helping us make decisions all along. Uh, this process, they asked some great questions and uh, we're generally very, very supportive of the plan that we have in place and understanding our, our sublease and, and our timeline and why we've adjusted to doing this and how that works with being out by January and, and in the leasing process. So that was very good. Uh, we, we also looked at the year-to-date report and there was two things. One, there was an extra payroll, so that looked a little high. And then obviously that additional revenue from the previous uh, fiscal year that now got shifted. And that's a permanent move, correct, Don? Uh, that time until shift? We, <laughs> until somebody changes their <laughs> mind? <laughs> until we get the next collection data. I mean, we don't know. I haven't, we haven't reached out to the treasurer to find out. Okay. what the tweak was and if it'll stay or if it'll be adjusted next year. It could uh, be just a, a fluke in the way that they had their schedule. Thank you. But it was a great dialogue. They got a little bit of a preview of what we saw here today. Um, but I'm happy to field any questions uh, on the FAC. Awesome. Uh, the district leadership did not meet and neither did, neither did uh, health and wellness. Um, that brings us to the public comment portion of the meeting. Uh, I want to do real quick here just a, a last call for cards. If there's anybody that would like to make a public comment tonight that has not submitted a card, um, please feel free to step up and do that. I have seven cards at this time. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start the first one. It's going to be Marshall Schmidt. He wants to talk about, uh, from the Pierce Downer area, he wants to talk about Longville. Uh, Marshall Schmidt, Pierce Downer. The administration has clearly decided to rush to sell Longfellow come hell or high water. The administration has simply stopped listening despite all of the things that have changed over the last months that it's being discussed just since uh, it was discussed at the December meeting. Tonight I address not the administration, but board members who have a fiduciary duty to oversee the work of the administration which frankly has not done justice to the children of this district. It is your duty as board members to question, test, challenge the administration to justify what it is proposing. <clears throat> the analysis that Mr. Leo presented to you and we'll discuss later makes clear that the course the administration is advocating will deprive the children of this district at a minimum hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars over time. To summarize the obvious errors and fallacies of the analysis, the analysis assumes that the district rents only a portion of what the district needs. For months, we've been told that the district needs 12 to 1,400 uh, square feet, or 12 to 14,000 square feet. Now suddenly, on the eve of this, it's 5,500. The $60,000 it's added in, that's not part of the lease. That's a plug number. That's a number that was made up and put in. It is not documented anywhere in the records that we have. In the long-term analysis, the $60,000 budgeted number is left out altogether. Over the 20-year analysis comparing all the options, only $60,000 is included. That's a million-dollar error. A million-dollar error. How can the community trust the board with a $128 million referendum when the board makes decisions based on analyses that misplace a million dollars. <laughs> Without explanation, the rental analysis provides a $40,000 annual credit for saving 0.5 FTE through consolidation when that amount would be saved if the administration is consolidated at Longfellow. That's not a rental benefit. That's a consolidation benefit. And so what the analysis does is it, it omits, is it never analyzes whether it makes more sense 
to keep Longfellow in the short term while you're discussing with the village what to do. That's nowhere to be found in the analysis. Nowhere was it considered what the costs and benefits would be of keeping Longfellow in the short term, moving the staff there, and then exploring the village option. My point is simply this. The analyses done by the administration have proven repeatedly to be unsubstantiated, unreliable, and flawed at fundamental levels. The most obvious example was the result of the first bidding process. After the fact, the administration tried to rationalize its recommendation, but the board is learning the hard way that the Longfellow property is not the cash cow that some people believed optimistically it might be. So the administration reduced its supposed rental needs, came Ten up seconds. with some number that isn't. I'd like just a, a few more seconds if I can mm -hmm. finish. Came up with a plug number that isn't guaranteed, isn't locked in. The sixty thousand dollars isn't locked in. It's nothing but certain. And now it advocates to bid against itself and collude with the builders to come up with a lower number. Now that so much has changed, the board needs to step back and reassess instead of rushing to sell and proceed on a course that has proven to be far more uncertain than anyone has ever admitted. To do anything less is simply irresponsible. If you fail to exercise your oversight responsibility right here and now before you commit to a long-term lease that is different than anything that has been before the board before, it's nothing more than gambling with the future of the children in this district. And if you choose to do that and you lose the gamble, you will be held accountable, whether you're on the board or not, when this all comes to roost years from now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Porus. My name is Porus Dadaboy. I'm a resident of Downers Grove. Uh, the Downers Grove uh, High School and the Education Board has done an excellent job. I attended the college admissions program, having done three for McDonald's over the years. Both my children went to the school, and they graduated in the honor rolls. Um, I'm here to uh, address two issues. One is on mass, and one is on cultural diversity training. A mask have become a, a cultural war, and I think what we have to do is follow the public health department of, down, of DuPage County and the governor's, and follow governor's mandates. On the question of uh, cultural diversity, our public schools have attempted to implement uh, DEI philosophy in their curriculum. In fact, the Illinois State Board of Education has adopted the policy and it is called culturally responsible teaching and it needs to continue. Misinformation is being spread that this is the same thing as critical theory, critical race theory, and it has become a political football. This mis misinformation claims that the cultural responsible, responsive teaching as well as the critical race theory, which is derived, are divisive and uh, promote hatred. This is totally false and patently false. Finally, uh, I am working with a group of students at, in the DuPage County, uh, DuPage County school system and they are doing a panacea study on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, I've, and this will be done by the students who are in the school. And I urge the board to listen to the students because they are not being represented either by the parents, the school, or the staff. And they will be ready for a presentation in 30 days. Uh, thank you for your time and appreciate being here. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Joe Leo, Pierce Downer on the long call. Good evening. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I hope you had a chance to review the memo that I sent, and I understand my time restrictions, so I won't uh, uh, belabor all the points, but I did want to let you know again that I'm concerned that the information you're receiving isn't complete. And what, what I hope to was accomplished through my memo was uh, explaining the, the problems that we saw. And I'll just kind of paraphrase a lot of these things. The revised table one I put in there shows the cost at specific by year. And this is important as we go through the memo because in most, most scenarios, we're not gonna see 10 years of holding Longfellow and many of the capital improvements were listed in years six through 10, years one through five were not as heavy. So as you can see, that changes the annual cost to hold Longfellow. Table two revised, I, I broke it out over 20 years just to see what it would look like and this is important when we're looking at table six over you know the complete lease analysis. And if you can see, if we run this out over 20 years, I mean, it's a $3.3 million of cost. Tables three and four were fine, um, but I, you know, understanding table four, it's clear that the additional rent for the conference rooms is $60,000 per year. Table five, I think is really important for you guys to spend the time and really understand what is happening, is it, it does talk about, you know, the cost comparison you know, over the seven years using the revised table one and further expanded a little bit below there is a look at if we early out after three, four or five years, which most likely might be the case if the village plan goes through. And as you know, with those early outs, there is a penalty and causes additional cost. So as you can see, the lease versus staying in Longfellow and by staying in Longfellow, you'll have to work with uh, Kevin and his crew, put together a plan to keep the building safe and functional for three more years. I think that can be done. It really can be done. Um, the costs, as you can see, are pretty significant to just staying in Longfellow, making it work, get your deal with the village squared away, and don't bother with this lease with uh, Aramark. And uh, Todd's right, the, the rates, it's a nice rate, but I don't believe you need to do that. You don't have to do that. Table six, some pretty big changes here. You know, number one, we, we gave a more accurate look at rent. We corrected the boardroom rental, which was shown $60,000 for 20 years, but really in effect it was 1.2 million. And again, this schedule, uh, I'll try to hurry up. Uh, does not talk about what happens at the end of the lease. You have to do something. You either have to re-up for another long-term lease or you have to buy in to the village. Nowhere is that shown. That's critical to understand that we're gonna pay rent and then we still have to make a significant investment in what we do. So, you know, it, my revised schedule six shows instead of a surplus of 492,000, it's $5.4 million spend. Significant change. Table eight talks about the additional revenue, but again, it does not address the fact that 20 12 seconds. new houses, right? 12 new houses means more students. Table nine is the one that you gotta focus on. This talks about a four year time frame, leasing at Airmark, staying a long fellow, $360,000 saving. You have to look at this. You have to go back and look at the, the route you're taking. Don't enter into the lease tonight. You don't have to do that. Get the order of what you're doing right. Figure out how to you know, continue your negotiation with the village, come to an agreement. Once you've secured that, then you time the sale of Longfellow, the conversion of the ASC to moving in with the village. This is the best option out there. Um, and I wanna be clear, I would rather you just renovate Longfellow. I know that's not happening. So let's talk about the most exponential and efficient route. Um, thanks again for your time. Uh, but please, one of you, two of you, three of you, all of you, 
stand up tonight and say, let's step back and not, don't go into this lease because once you go into the lease, you're done. You have no other option. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Having trouble reading the last name, Marianne Einerson. I can't read. I didn't send that. Standing up to talk, my question was just: Is there a reason for voting tonight when it's very clear that it's the number of people that are really against this are not here because there was a tornado warning? I mean, you guys were even in a tornado shelter for a while. People are not coming out. And is it fair for you to make a decision this evening without hearing? Thank you. Well, we don't enter into dialogue, but yes, uh, in, in general, um, this has been something that's been discussed in several meetings for several months, and so we do intend on taking action in the meeting tonight. Thank you. Kathleen Ramsey. Thank you, Dr. Russell and the board. Um, I'm completely stepping out of a comfort zone, but need to be a voice for my three daughters. My comfort zone is a teacher at a couple local colleges down the road. I have the pleasure of teaching a quantitative reasoning course. I teach my students that you can manipulate and present numbers to look any way you want. I also teach them when doing research or looking through case studies to look at the source. Is it biased, one-sided? Have you, have you taken the time to look at the opposing side of your argument or research? How was the study done? Was it fair, logical? Is there a logical fallacy involved? So now it is my turn to practice what I teach and make others aware there is other news besides mainstream media. When I hear doctor after doctor, especially a functional family medicine physician who is specifically trained in immunology and inflammation regulation, speak and say the CDC isn't truly the, the, the science and dismissing information, my ears perk up and consider it someone to listen a little harder. One of the studies shared that the coronavirus and other respiratory viruses are spread by aerosol particles which are small enough to go through cloth masks. These masks are not going to do what most want them to do and I'm done living in that fear. My three daughters' mental health, exposure to bacteria, and increased carbon dioxide through the wearing of a mask for long periods of time during the school day is not something I am okay with. If we step over the border to many surrounding states, this is not a mandate. This is never going to end if we don't take a stand now and allow parents to make a choice. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. David Ross. David Rose. I spoke at your last meeting about seeing Longfellow as an opportunity to reimagine both the facility itself and the way of living in Downers Grove. Since that admonition apparently fell on deaf ears, permit me to elaborate. Our need to reimagine arises because our way of living is not environmentally sustainable. To become sustainable, our way of life must have two objectives. One, use renewable resources at a sustainable rate, and two, shift from using non-renewable resources to using renewable ones. The latter is necessary for the logically obvious reason that using non-renewable resources means by definition depleting their supply. The recent societal push to use more so-called renewable energy is based precisely on the recognition we're depleting the supply of fossil fuels and altering the climate in the process. However, the term renewable energy is misleading because the, co the collection, storage, and distribution of solar, wind, and wave-sourced energy relies on using non-renewable resources. In other words, renewable energy is not nearly the solution that's cracked up to be. Our current way of life depends almost entirely on consumption of fossil fuels to do work. Machines driven by those fuels are aptly referred to as our energy slaves, and we, like all slave owners, don't want to give them up. Life without them is unimaginable. Thus, the difficulty of our task cannot be overstated. The extreme difficulty is the reason we're so reluctant to undertake it, but we will undertake it one way or another which is why I referred to environmental sustainability in my prior comment as the ultimate deferred maintenance problem. 
Either we continue deferring action until crises overwhelm us, or we stop deferring and change course. As I suggested in my July comment, Longfellow is a wonderful opportunity for Downers Grove to begin much needed course correction. Uh, how does it do that? In at least three ways, I believe. <clears throat> One, to retain the building and property as a public resource dedicated to learning about how to live environmentally sustainably. Two, to refurbish the building to be as environmentally light as possible and to do so in an environmentally responsible manner. And three, to use that project as the basis for the village, village's taxing bodies to begin coordinating with each other to address environmental sustainability as the core village-wide objective it needs to be. Each of these <coughs> has the potential to engage residents of all ages in a variety of exciting and challenging ways. Giving up our energy slaves will require a concerted, all-encompassing effort to figure out how to restructure. Our current political economic system is not oriented toward that end, which means if we the people don't provide new leadership and new vision, our current leaders will continue promoting an unsustainable way of life come hell or high water, as we are witnessing. With Longfellow, you have an opportunity to think and act outside the box, a prospect not easy to do in a town that prefers the seemingly safe, conventional, and belated. You, have a, you will have a more lasting and powerful impact on the lives of the district's children if you appreciate the greater educational value a repurposed Longfellow can offer compared to the land's mundane cash value as private property. So I urge again, keep Longfellow a public resource and in so doing, give yourself and fellow residents the opportunity and the motive to begin reimagining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last card, Megan Landers, uh, Whittier. Hi. Um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you for your continued service to our children. As of last Wednesday, the governor of our state took away our rights as parents and is now mandating that our children will wear a face covering for the entire school day. I can go on and on about how wrong this is. Parents should always be the ones making medical decisions for their children. Wearing a mask is a medical decision. It is affecting their mental and physical health. It's just a fact. They are wearing a mask for seven hours in a day in order to protect themselves from a virus that is no more dangerous to them than the common flu. Regardless of his reasoning, you are now left to figure out how to best serve this population by abiding to this mandate. As a parent, I would like to know what a typical day will look like for my kindergartner and my third grader. School starts in less than three weeks and I have no idea what the school day will look like for them. In fact, since we moved to District 58 a year ago, I have not once set foot in my child's school. I have no clue what the inside of their school even looks like. We need to do better. Parents in this community need to understand what the school will look like, the school year will look like, so that they can make decisions about their children's education. This is in no way disrespectful to my children's principal, but when I called to discuss my concerns, he was unsure if they would even be able to hold a meet the teacher, see your classroom type night for kindergarten. Why not? I'm supposed to stand on the sidewalk and watch my five-year-old walk into a place that he's never been to and I've never been to and pass his care along to someone I have never met. The principal was also unsure if teachers will be able to pro provide any small group instruction to children. I was a classroom teacher for 12 years and there is absolutely no way to meet the needs of an entire classroom of children without small group instruction, especially at the lower grades. And I know you addressed that earlier and I appreciate that. If our children must wear masks, which I wholeheartedly disagree with, we need to make it our goal to make their day as normal as possible. We need to make sure small group instruction is happening. We need to provide our children with ample mask breaks. How many will they be getting? Little kids will not ask for a mask break. It needs to be you know, dictated like once an hour. We need to figure out how many they're gonna get. We need to figure out a way to support their emotional needs and combat the effects of these masks that these masks will have on them. Um, how are we going to go above and beyond this year to foster relationships and build classroom community? Um, we need to be innovative. 
On a side note, I heard today that students in our middle school band program were wearing masks with holes cut into them while playing their wind instruments. Let's just think about that for a minute. How does that even make sense? Why are we doing this? We must not forget common sense. I understand you have mandates to follow and you're afraid of the repercussions if you don't comply, but these are our children. This is their education. And just as you pushed for more in-person instruction last year, you need to continue to push towards normalcy for our children this year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I got one more card here, Ryan Garrity. Hello, thank you for having me and letting me speak today. Um, my name is Ryan Garrity. Uh, Dr. Russell, you spoke to me this spring with me and my wife, and I appreciate that too. Take some time like that. And I just want to share my feelings on this. I'm an active member of my community. I have three boys, two at Kingsley and a, another one at Grove. Um, one has a uh, 504 plan, another one has an IEP. Um, I'm the vice president of the Kingsley PTA. I, I try to do as much as I can around the school. Um, I want to share some science right now because I feel like I need to stand up for my children right now. Um, fact number one, masks have never been proven to work for six plus hours. There's never been a study that shows this. I do believe in masks. I believe they work in short periods. I do believe we should wear them in a doctor's office. But there's simply no proof of these things. The way the kids wear them, take them off, touching their face, dropping them in the bathroom, they do not work for six hours. No one has ever proven they've worked. Further, one of the most popular masks, I've spent $100 on masks at Old Navy. On their website, it has a disclaimer that these masks do not stop COVID. It says it plain as English, plain as day on there. They do not work. Um, our children are also proven not to be carriers of COVID. They are not spreaders, they're not super spreaders. Dr. Fauci has said this, the CDC has said this, the IDPH has said this. Countless other scientists have said that kids are not super spreaders, they don't get as sick. Our teachers are vaccinated, our kids are not spreading this. Why are we wearing masks then? Why are we forcing them? Also, fact, there isn't a state within 700 miles of Illinois that has a statewide mask mandate, zero. I want to read those states really quick. Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, New York, Wyoming, Nebraska, Iowa, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Utah, Colorado, Kansas, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, Arizona, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, and Alaska. I probably missed one in there too. None of these states around us in 700 miles have a mask mandate, yet here we are in Illinois, in the middle of nowhere, stuck doing that. Do, do, um, is there just no COVID in those other states, or do masks work like miraculously only in Illinois and not these other states? I, I honestly don't know the answer. It doesn't make sense. I need common sense answers for this. But in closing, I just want to say it, it's just beyond time to put our children first, to take these things off our children. I know every parent in this room knows that we know what's better for our children than any politician in Springfield. This isn't any decision they should be making for our kids. And I understand what you've said. I understand a lot of hands are tied, but this needs to be said and this needs to be heard. We need to start standing up. I respect politicians. I understand it's a hard job to do, but in this case, they're wrong and we just stand up to them. Thank you so much for your time. That's all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, that was our last card for the evening. So that now takes us on to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the July 12th, 2021 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olchek. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the July 12th, 2021 regular meeting as presented. Next up, we have the approval of the consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements? 
consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials. So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right, a couple of uh, recommendations for action tonight. The first one up is the amended school calendar for the 2021 through 2022 school year. Is there a motion to approve the 2021 through 2022 amended school year as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? These were just minor changes. Uh, there was a date change on the DuPage Countywide date and then the election as well, right? <coughs> the primary election got moved to June. That's, That's correct. correct. So it moves from Mar to March 4th and then the election is in end of June. Correct, so Mar the March date was originally scheduled to be uh, a day not in attendance because our schools have to be polling places. Um, obviously we can now have that because the primary is uh, June 28th. And um, the other one is just a simple switch from which one would be the date of attendance and which would be the institute day because the county didn't put out that institute day. We guessed when they would normally have it and they picked the other weekend, which they sometimes have had it on that other weekend. So now um, I've re I have received questions from families. Our calendar for that institute day will now be aligned with District 99 for families and their planning. And it, it just worked out that the last day of school is a Monday, huh? The last day of school is a Monday. That was one of the benefits that to having a not an attendance day. Um, however, Typically, and I'm not saying that we will have a snow day, but if you did have a weather event, then you would move that to Tuesday anyway. So we will have to wait and see. Um, it is not preferred to have that. Yeah. Uh, the other alternative is to have a longer first week of school, which we often hear from our primary teachers is tough when our younger ones are, are starting to adjust back to school. Okay. Particularly when many of them have not spent a lot of time in school in the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, conversation, discussion? No. All right. Melissa, please go roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the 2021 through 2022 amended school calendar as presented. Next up is the proposed tentative budget for the 2021 through 2022, and, uh, and we need the approval of that tentative budget. Is there a motion to approve the 2021 through 2022 tentative budget as presented and make it available for the public inspection at the ASC office and on the District 58 website? So moved. Second. Discussion. All right, Melissa, please come roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the 2021 through 2022 tentative budget as presented and make it available for public inspection at the ASC office and on the District 58 website. We, uh, we need to set a proposed tentative budget uh, hearing. So is there a motion to establish the date for a public hearing of the 2021 through 2022 tentative budget for Monday, September 13th, 2021 at 7 p.m. right here at Village Hall? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to establish the date of the public hearing on the, tr on the 2021 through 2022 tentative budget for Monday, September 13th, 2021 at 7 p.m. right here at Village Hall. All right, next we have up is a resolution for the sale of property. Is there a motion to approve the attached resolution to sell Longfellow to the highest qualified bidder at a minimum sale price of $3 million as established in the resolution? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the attached resolution to sell Longfellow at the highest qualified bidder at a minimum sale price of $3 million as established in the resolution. Next up, we have a sublease of administrative office space at 2300 Warrenville Road. Is there a motion to approve the attached sublease for administrative office space at 2300 Warrenville Road as presented? 
a pending legal review. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, let's please go roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Nay. And Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the attached sublease for administrative office space at 2300 Warrenville Road pending legal review as presented. Next up, we have a bid for the ASC renovation. Is there a motion to award the ASC renovation bid uh, to Construction Inc. of Lombard, Illinois for a total cost of $364,000? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right. Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Nay. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to award the ASC renovation bid to Construction Inc. of Lombard, Illinois for a total cost of $364,000. Uh, we have surplus equipment, floor machines. Is there a motion to designate a C Ray floor machine and a Service Master floor machine as surplus equipment? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? All right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to designate a C Ray floor machine and a Service Master floor machine as surplus equipment. We have a bid for snow removal. Is there a motion to award the 2021 through 2022 snow removal bid to alternates number three and number four to DGO Premium Services? So Second. All right, any discussion? All right, well, let's please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the 2021 through 2022 snow bid removal with alternates number three and number four to DGO Premium Services. A couple of announcements. Uh, Tuesday, August 17th at 7 p.m., or I'm sorry, at 7 a.m. will be the policy committee meeting that will take place at the ASC. Wednesday, August 18th at 6 p.m. will be a special board meeting right here at Village Hall. Uh, Monday, August 30th at 3.45 p.m. will be the district leadership team meeting. I don't have a location in there. I don't either. <laughs> uh, location to be determined? To be determined, correct. Okay. Um, Friday, September 10th at 7 a.m. will be the next financial advisory committee meeting over at the ASC. And Monday, September 13th at 7 p.m. will be the regular board meeting back here at Village Hall. Uh, we already went into closed session and we have no additional items nope. still, right? Okay, good. So no need to go into a closed session at this time, which brings us to actions from our earlier closed session. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the July 12th, 2021 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of their contents? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Um, the motion carried. And finally, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The meeting will now be adjourned at 9.07 p.m.